Let me introduce Dr. Jill Rathis. Jill and I have gone back uh, working together for over 20 years, first as interns at Montefiore, and uh, then we collaborated in the Adolescent Depression and Suicide Program, and we co-authored uh, our first book together on DBT, uh, with Suicidal Adolescents, and we're now working on a skills manual together. So she's been one of my dearest and oldest friends and collaborators. She's a professor of psychology at CW Post Long Island University. Uh, she's the director of clinical training there in psychology. And uh, she is a behavioral tech DBT trainer. And I could go on and on, but without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Jill Raffis. Pleasure to be here today. I'm going to be talking about skills training with family members in DBT for adolescents. So the aims of my talk are to understand the rationale for including family members in adolescent DBT skills training. Some of this has already been alluded to in earlier talks. To identify the adaptations and new content in the walking the middle path module that we've developed for families in skills training and to conclude with the results from a study we conducted on the Walking the Middle Path module. So the rationale for including family members. Uh, it's important that the parents acquire skills in this treatment too, uh, for several reasons. One is that they are often feeling dysregulated and overwhelmed themselves. Um, they are sometimes less than optimally interpersonally effective with their teen, and that can be in part from the challenges in parenting an emotionally dysregulated teen. And similarly, they often come in feeling that they've become reactive, erratic, or extreme in their parenting, which also can be shaped, um, some of it might have been there initially, and much of it can be shaped by parenting an emotionally dysregulated teen. So when we include them in the skills, we're intervening directly in the evaluating environment that Alex was just talking about. Ideally, including the parents also provides models for the teens of more effective skill use. It teaches the family that similar language. It helps with skills generalization and helps the, the whole environment become more functional and more reinforcing of effective behaviors. The other thing that's really nice about it is um, the, the parents are actually pleasantly surprised when we ask the teens to validate them too. We want them to shape their parents positively, reinforce their parents, and validate their parents as well. So there, there's a lot of perks in it for the parents as well as it being very beneficial for the teens. The other thing that happens in the group that I didn't mention on this slide is that the parents become an incredible support group for one another. So even if they're not, sometimes they do um, attend outside support groups, but even if they're not, it becomes a support group for the parents involved. The families tend to get close and feel so validated by seeing other family members going through similar things. Um, we've made adaptations to skills training um, for adolescents and bringing family members in. Um, so one thing is that we include family members in a skills group right alongside of their teens in a multi-family group format. When we teach the skills, the standard DBT, DBT skills of emotion regulation, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, mindfulness, and the little path module, um, our teaching examples are really focused on teen problems and also family interactional problems. So we, we talk about family conflict, family interactions a lot, um, such as over homework, chores, curfews, spending money, permissiveness, rules, that kind of thing. We teach the walking the middle path module to families. Um, and then we have the other modes for family members that Alec had alluded to earlier, um, such as family sessions when needed, phone coaching for caregivers with a skills trainer, not with their teen's primary therapist. And something that we have seen in our practice at Cognitive Behavioral Associates and Great Neck is that there's been a real demand for as-needed parenting sessions, often with a different therapist on the team. So many of our parents come in 
separately for eight to 12 sessions of parenting. <laughs> And it, it's really um, DBT-informed parenting skills. So it's some traditional effective parenting skills, but also with the DBT knowledge and validation and the importance of regulating one's emotions and being mindful and, and that type of thing. But we find ourselves being pulled to do that more and more. Uh, to the point that I, I'd like to start to describe it as a, as a separate modality, an important separate modality of DBT for adolescents. Um, there are some issues in, in when we present specific content with both teens and parents' presence. Uh, one issue, for, there's many of these um, issues that come up when you're working with teens and parents in the same room. One of them is uh, some kids will say, I don't feel comfortable participating if my mother or father are in the room, or I don't want to go over my homework of what I did this week if my parent is sitting next to me. Um, and this is sort of a culture that we create in the group that we, we try to have other families that are more senior uh, model presenting homework in front of each other. It doesn't, they don't have to go into incredible depth about the most personal things. But to do it with the parents there, or parents doing it with the kids there, tends to be really effective. Um, we try to have them see it as transforming um, their anxieties about it into opportunities for learning and practice. And um, we reinforce and shape them for doing that. And we get their parents, we get the family members to reinforce each other for doing that as well. Um, also, the issue of presenting the biosocial theory um, how do you talk about emotional dysregulation without sounding like we're blaming teens or talk about a pervasively invalidating environment without talking about we're blame, with, that we're blaming parents? We don't want to sound that way. We're not meaning to do that. We're just trying to describe a transaction that occurs. So one of the keys is being very non-judgmental and descriptive and normalizing and talking about how the transaction um, has both emotion regulation and invalidation um, that it leads them to tend to grow bigger over time. And we discuss effective versus ineffective responses to emotional dysregulation. And it's not about judging invalidation, it's about having them find out what are the most effective ways to respond to emotional dysregulation. We also ask about invalidating experiences in parents' families of origin, and some of them can remember being invalidated at times themselves or being invalidated by other people, and that helps them understand what it feels like to be invalidated. So I want to now move to talking about our middle path module in particular and what family-based DBT skills we've included in there. And this was from doing this treatment for years with families and realizing that there were certain things that just weren't being addressed in the standard set of skills that we thought that the families could really benefit from. So the four main things we cover are dialectics, and a specific talk of dialectical dilemmas that we identified, validation, and behavior change. And I'll talk about each one of these. So when we teach families dialectics, uh, we first teach them the definition of dialectics and straightforward definitions. So for example, two things that seem like opposites can both be true. There's more than one way to see a situation or solve a problem. We get them talking about when we don't see things that way, when we're non-dialectical in our approach, conflict and emotional intensity tends to go up. But when we can start to see that there's more than one way to see a problem or situation, conflict intensity goes down. How do we use dialectics? We teach them how to move from either or to both and perspectives. For example, working to accept your situation and change it. You're doing the best you can and you need to do better. Your teacher is really strict and really nice. So two things that seem like they're in opposition can both be true. We also have them practice looking at all sides of the situation and finding the kernel of truth in every side. Uh, your point of view makes sense and my point of view makes sense instead of it's my way or the highway. You need to do your homework and I see that you could use a break right now. We also review, review some of the cognitive errors, that's thinking mistakes 
in that module, like all or none thinking, jumping to conclusions, labeling, and should statements, which tend to push us toward extreme non dialectical thinking. We've developed specific dialectical dilemmas. Uh, I'm sure there are many ways that parents and kids get polarized, but we've identified three that kept jumping out at us as we were working with these families. And so the three we identify and teach to parents and, and kids and see if they can identify these in their own family patterns are the extreme positions that they take. And, and these extreme positions, it, sometimes it's that the teen takes one position and the parent takes the opposite pole, but sometimes it's that parents themselves or even teens themselves flip-flop from one extreme to the other. Um, and so one of the dilemmas is too loose versus too strict. One of them is making light of problem behaviors versus making too much of typical adolescent behavior. And one is holding on too tight or forcing independence too soon. And this middle one, making light of problem behaviors or making too much of typical adolescent behaviors, that was alluded to earlier because sometimes it's very difficult for parents to either see that there are serious problems going on, you know, is this really something I have to bring my child in for treatment for, or is this just part of normal adolescent development, um, versus making too much of typical adolescent behavior. So many of the kids complain that once they've been hospitalized or had a suicide attempt, if they just want to go to a party or just want to get on the computer and go on Facebook with their friends, their parents are very nervous and, and don't want them to do it because they're afraid that this will lead to the next hospitalization or disaster. Um, and they're just trying to be normal teens. So there's a lot of fluctuation in trying to define what's normal. And one of the things we've developed is uh, a handout that um, demonstrates uh, it has a list of what's normal for adolescents and what's not to help people just go through different categories of behaviors and see whether what their teen is doing is pretty typical for adolescent behavior or whether it uh, goes to non normal adolescent development. How do we teach the dialectical dilemmas? We, we teach them, we ask them to I, all identify where they think they are on the polls. Um, one of the things we also do is provide a scenario for each poll of the dilemma and then let them guess which dilemma and then let them say how they might uh, come up with a synthesis or a middle path for the extreme position. So one example would be a 15-year-old girl who wants to sleep over at her boyfriend's house when his parents are away. The parents say, no way, no sleepover, and you're no longer allowed to have any contact with your boyfriend. So which dilemma do you think that might be? And, and that might be too loose or too strict, for example. And then we might ask participants, do you see any extreme positions taking there, and what might be a middle path solution? And then we have general guidelines for middle path solutions to taking extreme positions. And we talk about these dilemmas that come up a lot in the skills group. So examples are for too loose and too strict, have clear rules and enforce them consistently, at the same time be willing to negotiate some issues, making light of problem behaviors versus making too much of adolescent behavior, recognize when a behavior crosses the line and try to get help, at the same time, recognize which behaviors are part of typical adolescent development, uh, et cetera. So then we go to teaching validation. And although validation is taught as part of the give skill and in interpersonal effectiveness in DBT, we devote an entire two hour skills group to validation in the middle path module because it's that important. One of the reasons it's so important is because we know that invalidation escalates emotional arousal and heightened emotional arousal leads to interpersonal conflict. And another way to look at this is a way that Alan Frizzetti has conceptualized it, uh, which is that invalidation escalates, leads to increased emotional dysregulation. And when we're emotionally dysregulated, we have difficulty accurately expressing ourselves. 
So it's very hard to identify primary or secondary emotions when we're very dysregulated and say, I'm really feeling hurt or abandoned right now or disappointed. And instead, we're much likely to go to anger or intense communication or threatening communication. And when we escalate our communication, we're more likely to receive invalidation back from the environment. And what happens when we're invalidated, our emotional dysregulation gets even higher, more difficulty with self-expression, and so on, it, it becomes an escalating cycle. In contrast, when family members communicate understanding and endorse the legitimacy of another family member's feelings and experiences, emotional arousal is reduced. Intensity of conflict is reduced, as is emotional dysregulation and dysfunctional behaviors. Individuals feel soothed and relationships feel less aversive. For highly conflictual families where negative emotional arousal is pervasive, teaching the skill of validation provides the family with the means to reduce conflict and improve communication and build rapport. In validation, we teach the definition, what can we validate, how do we validate others, but also ourselves, because we know many of our clients are very, very self-invalidating. I shouldn't feel that way. I shouldn't get so upset. It's stupid that I feel this way. So we, it's just as important to teach self-validation to lower uh, emotional dysregulation. Why should we validate and how it's so effective in reducing arousal and interpersonal conflict? And a how-to guide to validate with six steps going all the way from active listening and staying focused to how to convey, really understand where the person's coming from. Um, and we do some val plenty of validation role plays too. We also teach okay, behavior change. Um, because, as we said, a lot of the parents are not feeling like they're effective in uh, parenting their kids. So, for example, this cartoon has a father saying, listen up and listen up good, because I'm only going to say this a million times. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to teach positive reinforcement, shaping, extinction, ignoring, and effective and judicious use of consequences in terms that are um, just concise and simple to understand. Um, and we try to make the points and plant the seeds, and if they need more follow-up on this, we give them additional parenting sessions. Um, uh, we really talk about positive reinforcement and increasing that positive reinforcement shaping because there's often a, a dearth of this. Um, and we also try to get them to increase their opportunities for positive exchanges since the balance of negative to positive exchanges has often gone really off. So, for example, here's a father saying, get into bed and I'll text you a story. <laughs> so we want to not only reinforce and teach them to pay attention to what they want to reinforce, but spend more positive time together as well. Um, we define positive reinforcement, shaping, and then we've also, in addition to that, and it's really important, we've developed a parenting shared pleasant activities list to increase conjoint positive time and change the balance of uh, negatives to positives. And this is not only for the sake of the family, it's also an emotion regulation strategy of increasing schedule of pleasant activities. It gets them more behaviorally activated, and it can be a depression reducer, but also in the context of improving family, positive family contact. So here's just page one of our um, Parents can share pleasant activities list, and we ask them that week to practice identifying three that they would like to share, and at least doing three that week together, and rate right, how it goes, how did it feel. Um, we do talk about extinction, ignoring what to ignore, and effective and judicious use of consequences, which are detailed on the slide, and I just want to have a couple minutes to talk about our study. We, um, a graduate student of mine, Bevan Campbell, and Alec and I did a mixed method study with 50 parents and teens um, <coughs> to assess the acceptability of the walking the middle path module because although many people have started to use it, nobody has evaluated it in its own right yet or done any kind of dismantling study to see if people, what people are getting out of it and if it has incremental validity. So uh, the results indicate 
high acceptability of the module for both adolescents and parents, and the middle path skills ranked highly among all the DBT skills that were put. We had them rank all the DBT skills in terms of how helpful, and many of the middle path skills were ranked um, as highly or higher than other skills. And the middle path skill of validation was considered the most beneficial aspect of all six months of skills training, with reinforcement close behind. Um, just a couple of comments and qualitative analysis for things like, my husband and I were able to communicate with each other better, discussing how to handle negative behaviors and how to implement consequences were helpful. The validation skills have provided benefits across the board. It is central to our improved family report. Self-validation, I thought about it all week, most people need to self-validate better, etc. Um, and a couple of other things they said is, um, validating helps create closer relationships, it is a specific skill set, middle path, that sets the tone for interpersonal contact and is more actionable between participants than some others and helps you be aware that there are always two perspectives. Um, and lastly, behaviorism was very helpful for my son to break some old habits. And so we did a qualitative analysis too and got some pretty um, specific feedback about what was helpful. So in conclusion, we talked about the rationale for including family members and adolescent DBT skills training. We identified the adaptations for families and the content of the Walk in the Middle Path, mo the Walk in the Middle Path module. And I presented results from the, our study on acceptability of the Walk in the Middle Path module. And teens and parents rated the module as highly acceptable and helpful and especially liked validation and positive reinforcement. And the study provides preliminary support for the inclusion of middle path as part of the standard DBT skills taught to adolescents and family members. <laughs>